even if you live alone like me, that's a totally different thing. I always say it's a different thing. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you live with your spouse or your partner. It's a totally different thing than when you live alone. Totally different. You've got to, your mind can take you down in, you know, it, it literally, it, it, it's a second and all of a sudden you're gloomy. And then you really need to work hard. And it's good to have your, I always say I have my circle of 20, which includes my closest friends and family who just make me know all is well. Actually, Omo makes a really valid point there. If you do live on your own and you're having to create your business absolutely solo without being able to bounce ideas off with anybody, it's really, really tough. I've definitely been there. So Omo's story is quite incredible. Um, you really are going to be inspired by some of the challenges that she's had to face at a very, very young age, moving country, um, losing family, um, having to learn different languages from scratch. It's just an incredible journey that she's been on. And certainly when you listen to Omo and her very wise words, you will realize that those challenges have made who she is today. There's no question about it. And that's why she's been able to get to where she is in running her own business today. So enjoy listening to Omo's journey. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Omo Zua. How are you today? I am very, very good, Michael. And did I pronounce <laughs> your name correctly? <laughs> yes, you did, actually. It's Omo Zua, but most people call me Omo. Omo. So... Yes. For the purpose then throughout this podcast, I'm going to call you Omo. It's a bit easier for me. <laughs> Absolutely okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. So the first question I ask all my guests is for you to share a little bit about your personal life, where you were born where you've moved around, a bit about your education, where you now live, maybe a bit about your family. But that's up to you. You don't have to. Is that sound OK with you? That is absolutely OK, Michael. <laughs> so um, I always like this particular question because it gets me to really reflect where I have been in my life and how it has contributed to the way I see life and mm. the way I operate in life. So I was born in Newport, Wales. Uh, I attended primary school in London. And my parents belonged to the generation that always moved back to Nigeria. So when I was around 11, I uh, moved with my parents and my siblings to Nigeria. Right. Lagos. And that's how I got my, I'd say, my African touch. I think those are very important years to really um, develop your character and the way you see life. So I lived in Nigeria till I was about 17 years old. And then my parents decided that, uh, you know, I go to, I come back to Europe to, to study, to train. And literally, I have lived in Europe ever since. Mm. Um, so I lived in Germany for a very long while. That's the reason why I speak German perfectly. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. <laughs> when, I, when I'm planning anything, um, when I'm going on holiday or when I'm a little upset, I catch myself doing all of this in German. And wow. I've got all, you know, two of my siblings and my nieces in Germany. So it's their mother tongue. And um, that's why I always get to sort of keep it upright, so to say. Mm. Um, I lived in Spain for a while and then um, I moved to Luxembourg. So I currently live in the heart of Europe, green, tiny spot. And um, that's literally where I've been for, say, over 10 years. And um, it, the, it's been the perfect spot to also live among people from all over the world, just because it's tiny, but very international with people from everywhere. So this has been a very amazing 
training ground, I would say. And and in terms of your education, did that have to happen in all these different countries? It absolutely did. Um, and how was education... that for you? Was that quite unsettling? I would say it was because I re I do remember moving from um, Wales to London and I had a very strict teacher. I do remember that. And I just did not fit in no matter what I did. And then when I finally settled in, my parents moved to Nigeria and that was just a whole different experience in itself and it took me a very long while to get used to it I, I remember being bullied I remember mm. being called the the different girl um, I, I had long hair and at the school I went to everybody had short hair so um, I wanted to fit in so badly I, I was desperate my mom would make me wear brown sandals and socks and everybody else was wearing like these nice decent looking plastic sandals and I would say mom I I want to fit in. You mm. need to cut my hair. And I remember her cutting my hair, crying her eyes out. But I had to survive. Yeah. I was being bullied so badly. And I just didn't even know how to tell my parents how bad it was. Mm. So um, it, it, it was very, very difficult, I'd have to say. And then at 17, being told that, um, okay, hop, 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 now you are moving to Europe. What did that mean? Mm. So I felt like my life stopped at 17 because one day I had all my friends. I had everyone I knew around me. And all of a sudden I was being sent to this who knows where place. Yes. We got there. It was uh, September. It was winter. It was terribly cold. It was dark. Mm. And it was Germany. And everybody was speaking German. Mm. So I, I think that in my life, maybe that sort of um, has mapped out the reason why I somehow feel good wherever I go, just because I have had to fit in each time. And it was always a choice. It's either you do everything you uh, have to to survive or you remain unhappy. It, it actually gets you to become very resilient to change, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When I moved to Luxembourg, I didn't know anybody. And I realized again how different it is when you're younger um, and you, you have to change. You, I, I think you're a little more open and you adapt way easier than you would when you're an adult and I moved here alone so unlike many people who move with their spouses and children I moved here completely alone and that was a whole new thing um the first week I have to say I was deeply depressed and I was crying all the time and asking myself what were you thinking Omozua what were you thinking you know, it's a different thing when you move with your parents or your sisters. <laughs> You've got someone to talk to. And I had to really work my way into going out, understanding things. Um, and I suffered from another thing, which was don't let people see that you're afraid. Don't let people know that you need help. Don't mm. let people know that you don't know how to do something. So I remember moving here with my brother-in-law and a very, very good friend of mine, all my possession in a, in a, in a truck. And I had written a list of everything they had to do before they left, just so that I would not need to ask anyone just because I knew I didn't have anyone to ask. Mm. And so why, that, why did you move to Luxembourg, if that's not too oh, personal yeah, to us? No, not at all. I finished university and everybody was, uh, you know, moving on, starting their first entry jobs. And I had zero idea what it was that I wanted to do. Mm. Um, and then this opportunity, I was, I finished university and I got this, 
full-time position at the language school where I worked and um, I was teaching. Um, I mean, that's what I studied, pedagogy, English linguistics and English literature, well, English philology, uh, Spanish philology and things like that. And uh, all of a sudden I was teaching. I was teaching people who were way older than me. Uh, I was, you, they were more experienced than I was. And it was a wonderful world that just opened me to this whole, it exposed me to these careers around the world and um, they were opening another language school here in Luxembourg and the my former boss had mentioned um, well you know what you're gonna do and I was like well who knows I, I was joking actually mm-hmm. maybe I'll, maybe I'll move to Luxembourg and he was like really you know and I said yeah 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 so I went home um, I couldn't find the country on the map So I called my brother-in-law and I said, hey, where is Luxembourg? (laughs) And he was like, oh, that's not very far away from us. So, you know, they live in Heidelberg uh, in Germany. And he said, yeah, that's just like maybe three hours away from where we live. And where I lived before in the north of Germany was about eight hours away. Mm. So I said, oh, why? He said, why are you asking? Well, I said, because it looks as if I might be moving there to open the, the the school, the branch there. And he said, okay, come on, come on, because then you'd be closer. And literally that's how I went back the next day and I told my former boss, well, you know, I'm moving to Luxembourg. Who do you need to inform? What do I need to sign? And that's literally how I made the dis- this decision. I didn't talk to any friend about it. I just knew that I needed the change. I had completed university. I had been teaching there in the language school for a year. And I knew something had to change. And that's what happened. Um, So before I knew it, everything had been organized. And um, a few months later, there I was packing everything as an adult on my own to a country um, that turned out to be my new home till now so far. And wow, okay, so I feel we've we've jumped a little bit. Um, <laughs> we've gone straight into Luxembourg and how you got there. When you were in Germany, when you were seventeen and moved there, did you huh? you had to learn German, presumably? I oh yes, and that was a. Terrible, I mean, it's interesting terrible. to hear that you ended up teaching language. Yeah. Uh, yeah. in English, presumably, is yes. it? Yeah. Yes. And so, but what, how did you get into, you know, speaking German? Did you go and study? Did you go to work? What? How did that all come about? Obviously, you did at some stage get to work there, but just let's yeah. go back to the beginning. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, no problem. So literally, um, getting to Germany, um, I had finished secondary school in Nigeria. And like I said, it was time to go to the polytechnics, universities, colleges. Mm. And here I was waiting a whole year, um, back 1989, I remember it was, waiting a whole year as my parents were trying to process this whole thing of us moving for a better education. It was a very, t- it's a typical thing that Nigerian parents uh, or African parents send their kids to Europe or to the States to study for a better education. And so there I was waiting, waiting a year. And then I would go to my mother's salon. She was, uh, uh, you know, she had a beautiful uh, hairdressing shop where I would then learn so much about women, listen to their stories um, Mm -hmm. and sort of help her out a little So um, moving to Germany was um, like a break in everything. It wasn't better. This is how I think I experienced it because I had waited at home for a year, whereas all my friends were at university. Uh, I was waiting. Then we moved to Germany and I think, okay, this is going to be really exciting. Then you get there and all of a sudden nothing is better because you don't understand the word they're saying. Mm. So again, I was on hold. I have this thing of being on hold, never ready or never finished. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I lived with my my sister and her her husband and her child, and uh, everybody spoke uh, German. We would spend a lot of time with her in laws. They all spoke German. 
So I was forced to really learn it. And her mother-in-law, my sister's mother-in-law was really great because she started putting these post-its and she would write the names of everything. I would go and help. She was very old and she would tell me stories from the Second World War as, she, as a child. You know, she, she, so she was one of the children and she would put stickers everywhere. And that's how I started learning. And then at some point, I really needed to go to, to the evening school literally to learn German from scratch. Yeah. And uh, again, I have to say, remember that I did speak German as a child. Yes. Because my, I, was, I was born in Wales, but my parents did move to Germany. So my very early years, I'd say, you know, three, four, five, six-ish, I did speak. Ah. I spoke German. Right. But when, when my parents moved to England... I literally had, I was forced to learn English. Yes. So I forgot every single word of German. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course. And then spoke it till I was 17, English, only having to go back to Germany to learn this language as a teenager from scratch. Yeah. 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 So was it tough? Yes, it certainly was tough. Yes. But what I realized was because I had all my sister's in-laws around me and they spoke German, um, and I, 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 it, it took a while. I think I didn't go to evening school. Well, the German, they call it Volkshochschule. I didn't go there till maybe like a year and a half after I got to Germany. So, again, a lot of waiting. In that period, I decided to do my A-levels because taking your results to Germany, they were like, well, that's, mm, you know, it's from Nigeria, so we cannot actually accept that. And then hearing back from all my friends who were like, oh, you know, we're just starting our second or third semesters. It was very depressing, a very depressing period. I just felt like um, I, w I was quite annoyed with my parents because that was not how it was supposed to be, Yes, you know? It wasn't, um, they were supposed to send my younger sister and I to London. And uh, till today, I still think I have a part of me saying, I wonder what my life would have, would be like if they had sent us to uh, England rather mm -hmm. than send it to my sister in Germany, where it was like thousand steps backwards to then move forwards. You had you were the only black person in the area. You experienced racism in a different way, which I never knew of, you know? No. Growing up in Nigeria, I had no idea that there were people who would just dislike you or treat you differently because of your skin color. Mm. I only knew, I only came across that when I moved to Europe, that you would go into a supermarket and people will be following you and that people don't smile and people don't talk to one another. People don't help one another. Mm -hmm. And then that was also the first time I came across looking at TV and seeing a picture of Africa the way I had not known it. I was like, where is that? Really? Mm -hmm. What, you know? And so the, it was very, very tough. Um, so in between f redoing certain subjects for my uh, you know, A-levels just to qualify to go to university. And part of it was then learning German. So I had learned German in the, in the, in the German folk socialist sort of evening adult school, but for university, they required even more. So I had to go to the Goethe Institute to do, you know, really specifically uh, 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 tailored for the university, tailored to the university uh, admission exams. That was a whole different world. And that's where I came across so many people from different countries, different countries across the world, all learning German, uh, how to write it, how to speak it. Because then I realized, oh, what I learned was good for speaking, but for the university purposes, absolutely useless. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, it was helpful to a certain extent, but not when they had to do with writing your papers, your coursework, etc., cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then going to university. And again, in my section, I was again one of the few blacks. Um, yeah, I have to say, very, very tricky. But I never stopped. In between, I worked. Mm. Um, 
because I, I, I had, while I was learning German, I had to kind of start earning money. And then I, I that was when I had my first job, yeah, around uh, yeah, 18, the whole while studying for my exams, learning German. And I, my first job was at Nazi Fish Restaurant. I remember back then. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was the youngest person among, I think the, the, the oldest person there was like 62. Right. And I was this 18 year old black uh, young girl, but always positive. I learned so much from these um, uh, people because, again, they, they were that generation, the kids from Second World War, kind of. Uh, they talked about their experiences of what their parents went through. They uh, just amazing mm. uh, very enriching and I, that's where i got my worth ethic from just work don't don't complain stop complaining work <laughs> you know yeah they do, don't, don't don't you know there's so much joy when you just do what you need to do and stop complaining i think that's what i learned that yes conditions are tough but just don't stop you know don't give up don't quit what else do you want to do if you can, you know, for them it was, we survived that. So what can be worse? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Wow, fantastic. So, and then after the fish restaurant, where did you go to yeah. after that? <laughs> finally, finally, I, um, then I think I decided it was so tough learning German. And then I decided to do a three-year training. That was, <laughs> uh, I went to a conference and I saw these chefs from all over the world cooking. And in that moment, I think I made this, I, I decided, you know, that's what you want to become, a chef cooking and traveling the world and, you know, presenting food in the most romantic way ever. And so that's how I actually had a stint as um as a as a chef and i i did my training to become a chef so i can cook everything uh european well i'd say specifically german mm -hmm. and so that was like my second training because my when i was in nigeria waiting that one year to be sent who knows where yes. that's where i my training as a hairdresser because my mom was a she was a, she was a you know hairstylist yes and so my second training and uh, literally I, I I did that for three years yeah worked as a chef but then I finished and then was the question is this it <laughs> and the whole time I was still learning my German on my own and then I finally handed in my papers to university and uh, I saw the building and said well I'm going to study here yeah and that's how I stopped my career as a chef and then uh started studying wow yeah and what what did you study next <laughs> Well, what I studied next was I went into, I mean, I, I don't like numbers, unfortunately, and I'm afraid of blood. And as much as I know that those uh, were the kind of uh, careers that my parents would have loved me um, to do, um, I mean, by this time, a lot had changed, I have to say. I know I make it sound quite, quite uh, lovely, but um, I moved 17 to Germany and uh, two years later, my mother died. So mm -hmm. that is actually what caused the whole stopping the journey to go to university and then having this stint as just get any kind of job. And mm -hmm. then I decided to train as a chef. So I was also undergoing the loss of my mom mm -hmm. and uh, growing up in, in, a, in a setting that wasn't so, um, um, well, you know, you need a guide. I, I don't think that at 19, you know what you want. I yeah. missed having being able to call her and just say, mom, what do I do now? Um, mm. So that was the day I grew up. Of course. I, I had, to, yeah, we all grew up. My, my brother was four. My younger sister was 11-ish. Uh, I was 19 and my older sister was uh, 21. Mm. And I grew up that day. The day we got that call, I remember it was late in the evening and uh, a very good family friend and uncle of ours just called and said hey kids are you all sitting yeah we are and yeah your mom your mom died um i don't know if i understood what that meant no um, I never i never went to her uh her funeral only my older sister did mm. 
Um, I don't think I cried for the first three months. No. Because I don't think you, I, I don't think I understood what that meant. But as time went on, I realized that I had to grow up. Yeah. I, I started realizing that I could not call her and say, Mom, what do I do now? Who should I call? What do I do next? Mm. It was not possible. So this is the journey that I went on, um, choosing, okay, or more. In Germany, they always say, do a training because just to be sure, you never know if your university degree will help you, but at least you always know you can fall back on your training. Yes. Right? So that's why I did the three-year uh, training uh, to become a chef. Mm. So it wasn't enough. And then I went to university and then I realized, oh my God, it's German. You know, I did learn German, but again, um, I seriously, seriously, uh, I doubted myself that I would be able to manage. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wanted to study law. I thought, okay, law is the least invasive. <laughs> 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 no, I just didn't understand it in German. It was just bad. I did not understand it. <laughs> so I went, I, I didn't understand it. And I said, oh, well, okay, no matter what, you need to do something that will still keep you close to English. So that's how I literally studied English philology. And then they said, well, you have to choose three subjects. And I was like, oh, my God, really? So after roaming around the campus for days with a friend and saying, no, 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 I don't like this building. Like, I literally refused some subjects because I didn't like the building. Mm. I was like, looked at everybody and I said, oh, my God, they look so intelligent. They look so wise. I can't I can't cope. I'm not enough. Um, but then I found my way. I then went for English philology, you know, literature, linguistics. I did the Romance languages. And then I just went for philosophy, which was tough. Mm. Uh, it would have been better studying law. All <laughs> of this in German. All of this in German. And That's then good. I studied uh, pedagogy. So the art of teaching, yes. the science of teaching. And so literally that was my 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 way, my journey. Um, did I know that I wanted to teach? To be candid, I, when I think back, I don't know. I think I just chose the most, the least invasive <laughs> courses for me, just because I knew I wasn't good at numbers and I knew I didn't like blood. But also dealing with that feeling that my dad would be so disappointed that I was not taking up one of the recognized professions. Yes. As a, as a Nigerian daughter, mm. it's logical that you study medicine. It's, I don't, you know, I don't know how else to explain. It's just, that's just the way it is. Sure. But if you, can, if you cannot study medicine, then obviously you want to study something with engineering that is accepted. It's recognized. Yes. <laughs> if you don't do that, then at least do something. Okay. We can manage accounting, you know, accounting. That's still, mm, it's still okay. <laughs> yes. Now, if you do anything other than that, oh, geez. Mm, no no that, not no. acceptable it's not acceptable it's more it's actually embarrassing you know it's embarrassing I remember many times when the, my first semesters my dad would actually call me and he would say something like so how's your medicine study going on <laughs> <laughs> I was like dad no I am not studying medicine and I don't know if he just didn't hear it or if it was so you know we had a while it took him a while to understand okay what exactly are you studying what what are you doing what is it that you're doing and um I I still went my way though I, I still went my way because I knew that that was what I wanted to do. But sure. that's also how I came into, um, you could also do some extra courses like mediation. And I think that was my first, uh, yeah, opening, right, to understanding that, oh, there are actually teams that have issues. Aha, uh -huh. people that have to, you have to actually put them apart, <laughs> and then talk to one party before you talk to the other party. And that's how I became quite aware of the of the struggles. And I always had a student job. 
So I was always with people and seeing, oh, how do you deal with that person? That person is angry with that person. Why are you angry with that person? <laughs> yeah, but that's just a miss. You, it's just because you didn't communicate properly and it, she misunderstood it. So I've always been exposed to humans interacting with each other, like really, you know, being there in the team. And I worked in a cinema. So there were even more people. You had to tell them, okay, go this way, go that way. Um, very, very interesting. So I studied, I worked, met more people, had my my friends, had my 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 family so to say you know i had to rebuild my family i mean i wasn't going to my true family uh, meetings birthdays weddings of my cousins that that stopped yes. the moment my mom died um you know she died when i was 19 and i did go back that was 1994 and i think i didn't go back to nigeria till 2012 wow yeah yeah. So I always I, I feel like I I am a cocktail, a non-alcoholic cocktail with different ingredients. And some ingredients I've have I've had to just kick them out, like uh, not asking for help, like helping everyone, but not telling people you need help. Mm. I used to admire my friends who could just they had so many people helping them. I admired them like, wow, what is it that they're doing? that I'm not doing till I learned that what you're doing almost that you're acting like you're a robot. Yes. You're not, you're human. Yes. Your mother died and you had to build your life. You had struggles there, you know, um, life was not easy. It wasn't easy working in the rest of fish restaurant. Mm. My hands were so cracked. When I look at my hands today, I am quite surprised actually that they look normal. <laughs> Back in those days, because of the chemicals and the washing. Yeah, you know, I, I, I really, from core, I was clearing the tables. Yes, yes. I was clearing the tables. I was making the different uh, sandwiches with the different fish. I was cleaning those, you know, things where the metal pieces after frying fish all day long. I was emptying the oil. Um, I was cleaning the, 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 the tables, washing the dishes. So my hands were bad, you know, yeah. but still. I, I head high, head high. It made me, uh, it made me strong. And I think when I started university, I do know that people say, "Oh, you're not really young, are you? You, I mean, you're young, but you're kind of like, like an old young person." <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean to be old young? It's like, I said, no. We are, we are kind of, you know. I was twenty five or so when I started studying. Um, so that's that was. The journey, you can imagine, reaching Germany at 17 and not actually starting university till I was about, yeah, 20, 24, 25-ish. Yeah, absolutely, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, But it's okay because in that time I trained, I worked, I earned uh, my little money, I, 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 I made friends. I even rented my own apartment once but then moved back to my sister after a while. So I did learn quite a lot about myself as a person and that I can change and I can adapt and it's okay because I don't answer to anybody but myself at the end of the day. Brilliant. Brilliant. And then how did you get into um, the, the language training business? All that yes. <laughs> how did that so, come about then? So after all, did that happen after your studies when you when you? No, during. During. During studies. So yeah. I'd say the last the last two years. So when you start in the university, you always get these uh, uh, letters from the, the foreign students. Uh, students offer saying there's this language school looking for English teachers you know and back in those days I was like oh what do these people want from me I cannot teach I'm shy I don't talk to people who am I I'm barely surviving trying to understand this book in German mm. <laughs> which is one of many so I was like no 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 I, I what, what does that even mean because I didn't study um teaching per se at that time you know it's one thing doing it in practice and one thing doing it theoretically yes 
But then in my, I think a year and a half into, yeah, two years before I finished, I got this letter again. And it had actually come to me on the day that I don't know what happened. I was just like, oh, what is this paper that these people are always sending to me? <laughs> and I don't know what happened. I called. I called and that day changed my life. I called and I said, hello, I keep on getting this paper from the university's, uh, you know, foreign students office. What, what do you want? Yeah, we're in language school and we are looking for people to teach. And I'm like, okay, good. Um, you know, English is my native language. I can't teach German. No, no, no. We're looking for an English teacher. I'm like, okay, good. So what do I do next? They said, come down to an interview. So I came down to an interview. I met with the pedagogical supervisor, Ian Thompson, back then. And uh, yeah, he interviewed me, asked me some questions. Uh, I was like, okay. He said, good. So fine. Uh, you'll have an interview with the director of the school. And then you start the training. And so I did the training. I met the director. Uh, he said, okay, good. Um, I mean, it was like a breeze, to be candid. I don't know what happened. Before I knew it, I was sitting with another 12 uh, teachers from all, you know, they were all languages trying to teach for training to teach for the school. Different languages, Russian, there was a Swedish uh, trainee. There were five other English teachers from all over, you know, Scotland. That We had an Indian <laughs> An Indian English teacher, uh, just, just, uh, he, he, you know, it was just interesting. And before I knew it, I started teaching. I know that in the first month, I, I think I taught for maybe, I don't know, seven, seventy nine units. So one unit was like forty five minutes. Yes. And that was the last time I taught that little. After that, I was just on. Omo, do you want to teach? There's this person. It's 7.30 in the morning, and I live 10 minutes away from the school. Right. <laughs> I was like, no, no problem. And again, I was studying. I was oh actually my God. studying. Yes, <laughs> because I always worked. So I stopped working in the cinema when I got this job because it felt like an elevation, right? Yes. Now I was teaching people and I felt, oh, this is this is an opportunity. So I stopped, you know, removing, um, you know, ushering people into the into the cinema halls and stuff like that. And I, I became a, a, a language teacher, English language teacher, teaching people meeting and presentations, language for business, um, negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just phenomenal because I was teaching Germans, uh, Spanish, French, or just every every nationality that came to 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 sign up and enroll for for classes, literally. Yeah. So I did that, um, and it was just amazing. I I so, so very strange that I still consider myself shy. Um, because I do still feel I'm shy, but now that I'm even saying it, it's so funny because we even had like 30 to 40 stu students who came from the um, employment office and they were on a program to improve their language skills and we would help them with CVs, uh, preparing for interviews in English and just teaching them. And I'd go on with them for eight months in a row. It was just a very, very amazing time. Three and a half years or, or four years of doing that before I moved to Luxembourg. Uh, so I completed university and then they said, hey, look, you know, what are you doing? now I said well I don't know I was a freelancer and they said okay good we're going to offer you a permanent uh, uh, position yeah so before I actually <laughs> completed university I already had my permanent job so that's literally how I got stuck in that and I you know I have no regrets whatsoever because I was teaching people from telecom t-systems great companies eon energy like top managers directors executives and back then I didn't understand exactly what was I what, what I was learning yeah. but I was learning so so much whether it was groups whether it was children I, I i worked on saturdays they would say oh look this person has an interview um, the other teachers don't want to teach do you, do you would you mind i'm like i live 10 minutes away i mean i'm not doing anything i'm either studying writing my thesis or so it was a good getaway for me you know es escape 
Yes. Because I could just still be doing something productive, but at the same time working on my thesis. And you enjoyed it, right? Oh, I loved every bit of it. Like I told you, you know, working with those um, wonderful people at the age of 18 made me learn something, a, a key thing. Stop complaining. Yes, it doesn't mean you like everything of it. You don't, you, it doesn't mean you like everything about things. However, just do it. Yes. You have less struggle internally. I mean, what's the point of What's the point of doing something, <laughs> feeling stressed about it? It just increases your stress yes. and how you experience it. So I, I loved it. I did. I mean, I, was I tired? I, don't, I didn't mind. You know, I've always had, uh, I would go to the gym on my bike. It was in between my work and my home. I'd ride down the street early in the morning at 5. They opened at 5.15. When I got there, there was nobody there. I could use all the equipment yes. with no pause. I'd ride, you know, roll back home because it was sort of a bit downhill. So I, was, <laughs> I didn't have to work too much for that. And then I'd have, you know, get prepared. I'd go to, go to university, get my book, study a little. And then I had my classes, you know. Um, and I was different, of course. Now I understand what my friends meant by saying that I was an old, young person. Yeah. And now I know I wasn't an old, young person, but I had to take responsibility. I knew what it meant to work. I knew what it meant to pay tax. I knew what it meant to have responsibilities. Uh, I knew what it meant to be on time. I knew, you know, when when every when the students were like, "Oh, bye! Oh, we've got lecture free period. We're going to Thailand. Oh, my, don't you want to come?" And I was like, "Sorry, I can't. I have a job, you know. <laughs> so either I was teaching or I was at the cinema." Yes. And at the cinema, I was working like five days, you know, not not the whole not the whole day. So there would be some uh, sessions where my shift would be uh, from uh, 11 till five or sometimes from two till 11 30. Or if I had the night shift, it would be from, uh, 5 PM in the evening till 2 AM. So I had to lock the whole cinema up, check all the, we had like 10 halls, check that there was nobody hiding in between the seats, going through the security and, you know, the exits. Uh, yeah. But it was fun. We played cards and I just learned that it's, 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 it's life. I learned you, it's not about what you do. It really isn't. You know, when I went into the bathrooms to check that nobody was there, you know, some people drink a little bit, you know, a bit too much or they want to, you know, I'm like, okay, it's over. You need to, you need to leave. And I'll ride back home on my bike. Yes. Was I tired? Oh, well, sure. But let's not forget, I was studying at the same time. Mm. And so I would go home, sleep for two hours, and I knew, okay, now you have to study. Yeah, so you do what you need to do. And and the, the studying that you did um, yeah. helped you with the teaching that you were doing, correct? Or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The training that they gave us helped. The, the, the studying helped. And also just like being able to adapt to the different people mm. because I was teaching people not only IT, uh, accountants, really different, different fields. Wow. So I learned a lot from them. You know, I'm not a banker, but I taught so many <laughs> that I would like, you know, I'd learn from one client. And then the next time I had another client, they would be looking like, wow, mm. you're quite, you're quite informed. I'm like, oh, I just remember things. That's, that's, <laughs> that's it. You know, I remember I can relate. I can, I can, I can adapt. And I think that's why I always had uh, full, my, my schedule was always full. So, mm. uh, um, you, the secretary, uh, she would always say, Oma, can you please, 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 can you? The, the other teacher is sick. I'm like, it's okay. I know you only have two hours break in between and then you have five hours of work after. I'm like, it's okay. You know, I was happy to meet new people. <laughs> wow. Okay. So what, what, okay. So let's, let's move on then from 
so this was happening in Germany. Then you moved to Luxembourg and yeah. opened the office there. And that's where yeah. you were working flat out as well, presumably. Yeah, and flat out. Flat, flat out. out. And then mm -hmm. what, what happened next, Omo? Oh, Luxembourg opened a totally different world. I was being sent to companies. I was especially like banks that I had never seen before. Mm. I was teaching um, the CEOs of different banks. You know, I went into Deutsche Bank. I went into Landesbank Luxembourg. I went into SEB. Oh, these different professions. Fantastic. Just fantastic. But there was a calling. There was a calling. What I knew is that students always like, I remember leaving Germany, students were really like, I can't believe you're leaving. How, how is that even possible? Uh, my colleagues were, how are you leaving? And I never knew what that meant. You know, I was just like, oh, come on. You know, it's a farewell. Don't make it bigger than it is. Yes. Um, and here also. I would go into places and <laughs> had come out and the secretaries would ask me like, how did you get him to laugh? Because normally our boss does not laugh. I'm like, I didn't tickle him. I didn't tickle him. I was just normal, human. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> human. <laughs> so I did a lot of teaching. And I, but, but my teaching, I always knew that there was, I got to know the people. It wasn't just English. It never only was English. I experienced when they were sad. I experienced when they were down. Yes. I experienced when they were stressed. I experienced when maybe somebody had shouted at them before they actually came into the class. Mm. I experienced adults cry. I experienced when a CEO who was going to have to tell his employees, 275 of them, that, guys, mm. the bank will be closed. I saw how the bank went from this 275 people to one. Yeah. I experienced their stories. I saw how different people coped. So it opened a whole new world to me. And because I've always been in this setting that I, I can observe, I remember back in Germany, something that I would do in my free time, some people might call it strange, but I loved going to the airport in Hamburg, large airport, of course. It's what, you know, among yes. the largest in Germany. And I would either go to the departure area you know, as far as I could get, uh, having no ticket, obviously, or the arrival area. Yes. And I would just take book, music, have my apple, my, my you know, a, a real fruit to eat, <laughs> or bananas. And I would just go and start looking, watching, observing people, observing how they behave. You know, those who were really sad to see someone go, those who were like, oh, my God, do I really have to wait till you go? <laughs> <laughs> and I would learn like wow this this nonverbal language you know um I love going to the arrivals because you could just see the joy um you could see where it was cold and I loved doing that just sitting and watching and just like oh that's interesting and you know after that I, I would take the train back home wow <laughs> The keel, and I love them. People are like what? That's the strangest hobby. I said I don't know why, but I think it's quite interesting. <laughs> <to be added. laughs> it was quite interesting. So I've always been in a situation where I could just observe people, and I have to say, knock on wood, I you know I have never had issues connecting with people mm. just because I I. I I think we're all energy, really. I'm energy, and I think uh, everyone else is energy. And energy is supposed to attract and not repel. This is not to say that there are people that I just don't connect with, but mm. that's also okay. I'm okay with that. Um, I then had the honor of teaching somebody who told, who happened to be the former. Uh, he, he used to be a, a president of the ICF, which is the International uh, Coach federation the luxembourgish branch and once he said to me has someone told you it was supposed to be an english lesson right but like yes. i said my lessons always turn to be human lessons at the end of the day sure people tell me what's going on and i i encourage them and motivate them and say it all will be well all will be well breathe and be all will be well yes and um, this student had said you should become a coach 
So I laughed. I said, oh, <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> a coach? Well, what does that mean, a coach? Um, he said, not a sports coach. Check it, you know. This was in, I'd say, late 2008. So that means I moved here to Luxembourg in 2007. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a one-year thing, right? A one-year thing, something has to change. Right. And yes, it was 2008, and I could feel it like the wind. I was like, is this it? It's not that I didn't like what I was doing, but is this it? I needed a change. And that's how my coaching uh, career began because I I Googled it and I was like, whoa, this is interesting. Then it took me quite a while. You know, I didn't take it serious at first because you know how the brain kind of reacts to what feels uncomfortable, like, oh, um, who do you think you are becoming what you just read about? There seem to be so many intelligent people, you know, wise. Um, But I summoned up courage, and then I found a school, the New Insights Life Coaching Training in England, um, slash South Africa, Uh, and I spoke to Mr. Bill Burridge, who was the, who is, still is the you know, uh, director, CEO of the, of the school. Mm -hmm. And I was so intrigued. And so I just said, okay, I can afford this. Um, because that was a struggle finding an affordable, uh, training, uh, you know, coaching training, but that was really in depth. And that's how I started my journey. And as I started, I was like, Oh my God, I do this all the time. Yeah. That's what I do. That's, I started recognizing me so my training was more coaching me actually yes my values my beliefs my rules for feeling good embracing every day knowing that it's okay to wake up and not feel good don't pretend it's not there acknowledge it start to talk to it journal i started learning so much yes and after three years of study because I was working full time while trying to, yeah, and it was intensive, intensive. I had my exam, I passed with meritorious distinction. Oh, and then I was a coach. And I was still working my nine to five. And I had a boss back then uh, who was like, oh, fantastic, that's just amazing. Uh, so you can coach now. And he was okay. So I was, I had my nine to five and step by step, I started having uh, clients who were like, so happy, like, Oh my God, you, you pass. Okay. What happens next? And I started having clients and I remember my first client, I was so excited. I was like, Oh my God, Mm. this is awesome. I get to coach someone and nobody is supervising me. And I realized, stop, Omar. It's a human life. Come down from your high horse and don't forget that that person needs to be okay when he's finished this six-month journey with you. I had one client. I had another client. I had another client. Always one-on-ones. And I learned. And I learned to travel journeys with these people as they unleashed their own insights to build their own resilience. And on the journey, I think sometimes I I forgot to actually realize that, Omar, you are also achieving things, you know? I don't think I, did I celebrate when I passed my exams? I don't know if I did. Mm. I don't know. So as I helped other people, I don't think I did a lot in stopping myself to see Come on, celebrate your wins. Acknowledge and recognize what you've done, you know. And uh, I came across uh, uh, an NLP guru master, and uh, he was talking about emotions, and I was so intrigued. And why was I intrigued? Because prior to talking, finding out about this particular teacher, Uh, Where I live, I used to have a neighbor, and she was always helping people. She was always smiling. And one day I had met her downstairs. That was in the early years when I moved here. And I remember asking her, uh, 
uh, oh, hi, you know, that's what you do in Luxembourg. Everybody's an expat some, of, of some sort. Yes. For it. So you say, hi, are you here with your family or something? And she said, oh, well, I used to be here with my family, but uh, I lost my family in the tsunami. I remember my hand going to my, uh, to, uh, I was shocked. Mm. Like, oh, my God. And I said, oh, I am so sorry. And she held me. She said, oh, no, don't do that. I've already gone through the emotions. I lost my three sons and my husband. And when I met this guru master and he started talking about emotions, I remembered her. We, we, we became friends before she moved away. Yeah. And I learned so much from her. She, she would share with me the pain. She shared with me how she saw her family being washed away, how <clears throat> she let go of her youngest because the force of the water was so strong, she couldn't uh, hold on to him. But she held on to something, and somehow she lived. She survived. And for a long time, she felt she hated herself. She was angry. She she was depressed. And I, I remember those talks with her and uh, how she told me, now I'm grateful. I had a family. I got to know those souls. Those souls were introduced to me by the universe, and uh, that's how I want to remember them. Mm. So I was so int intrigued in knowing about how do we react to emotions, because then I could uh, I realized how do you feel about the fact that you grew up without your mother? How do you feel about the fact that? You um, got disconnected from your 17-year-old and who that 17-year-old would have become had she not left Nigeria. And so when I went back in 2012, it was so odd. I went to visit a friend, a very close friend, only this friend. I don't know why, I just felt I needed to be home. But so funny, I didn't really, you know, it was, it was, it was a very, I just needed to heal. I needed to see the continent again. And a friend um, had seen, she had uh, written on Facebook. I don't know, she found me on Facebook and she had said, oh, hi, you know, I'm trying to reunite the 1989 class from the town where we studied. Yes. So I had. Uh, oh hi what a surprise and you know I don't know why I did it but I just wrote I'm in Nigeria and she has said you're lying you are in Nigeria and she said where are you I was like I was in Lagos and she was uh she said look that person I found that person there I found that person that's their number call them so from wanting quiet time just to reflect, I don't know what I was searching for. Mm. But then I found my friends, all like a lot of them. I, I learned that some had died. I I that that saddened me. Sure. But many were alive. They were all in Lagos and they didn't know that they were in Lagos. So as I was calling this girl, my, you know, she's on her quest of reuniting everyone. She was sending me their numbers. I was calling. I'm like, hey, I'm here in Lagos and I don't really have anything to do. And they were like, why, why are you alive? We thought you died. Wow. And because when I left, they were all at school. And one day my parents said, okay, tomorrow, let's pack. Two days later, we're in Lagos, and a day later, I was in the plane. Yeah. I sh shipped away, shipped away. I couldn't even say bye-bye to my friends. I couldn't give them a number. I couldn't give them an address. Um, so some of them actually thought I was dead because they came back from school and I was not there. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's how I lost my first love. <laughs> mm. My boy, I, 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 that's because he came back and he said, "Yeah, you, you were simply not there. We were just gone." And I was like, "Well, I was seventeen. What? Uh, my parents sent me off. What was I supposed to do? Say no." Mm. 
you can't really do that, can you? No. So all of that came, and I've just been so intrigued, um, finding back my 17-year-old in the sense that meeting all my friends um, taught me, it showed me to a certain extent how my life may have been had I remained there. And I made peace. It was okay. They were, it was good to, by the time I called all the numbers this friend gave me, we were about um, 15 that met. And I, I told them, meet us there, meet me there, meet me there. And friends picked me up. Seeing them, they were like, ah, you're a big girl now. I'm like, I'm a woman. Like, you're a man. <laughs> I'm not a girl anymore. You've grown, in case you did not notice. <laughs> it was such an amazing reunion for all of us. And I said, guys, you people have each other here. Mm. You, they were meeting in the parking lot and saying, what are you doing here? They said, I don't know. I got a call from Omo. So I came to see if it's true. It was a beautiful reunion, just so impromptu, but very nice. And so I healed also from that. Yeah. Again, those emotions. So emotions intrigue me. Emotions, um, they, they determine every single way you operate. Whether you drink too much coffee it's due to what you're feeling right mm. <laughs> whether somebody smokes too much you know that act of taking the cigarette to calm oneself down it's because you feel something whether you're clingy in a relationship it's because you feel something whether you lash out at your subordinates those you manage at work it's because you feel something. Whether you're just down, stuck, low, depressed, it's because you feel something. And so this intrigued me. All these different things. How did I feel before I, I, I reconnected with my 17-year-old friends? I, I journaled. And how did I feel after? When I was flying back, I had a smile on my face because I knew all is well. All is well. All is good. No regrets. No regrets. No. Not at all. Beautiful. And, yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Just, just a wonderful, wonderful journey that you're you know, have gone through, and I'm sure there's a lot more to come ahead as well. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so. So having, you know, discovered the kind of whole coaching and getting all your clients and everything, so you then decided to take the leap and leave the language company? Exactly. So I, I would say I always knew um, I, I started growing into it. I don't think I knew what it meant to be an entrepreneur, given that I had always been an employee forever. So I did the, I did the uh, training. I got certified. I was certified to become an emotional mastery coach. Um, I started the neuro leadership training and things like that. Mm. But I don't know if I really in my mind knew what it meant to be an entrepreneur. Not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people, they talk about, oh, I want to be free. I want to travel. I don't think I thought about it like that. I just knew that I wanted to help people. I knew I wanted to put this whole knowledge that I had accumulated. I knew I wanted to put it into practice. And I knew that, okay, this meant that I would have to stop working. But there, it was security, right? So I would not, I wouldn't, uh, actually take the, this thing that you, you call taking the leap. I don't think I took the leap. I think the leap happened to me. Right. Uh, and, and, and that was a totally different thing. So I was forced into it because after 
um, uh, after a while, I was told, okay, we are terminating your, your contract. And lucky for me, I had been trying to build my practice for two and a half years. So being laid off did not catch me unawares or unprepared. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. I, I had. I had already got clients. I I was, you know, learning. I was already, I knew what I wanted to do. I, I knew I wasn't being laid off from a job that I knew I had learned everything that I could possibly learn. And I, again, I was asking what next, but I could not make that leap because you think about the security. Yes. You think, about, okay, oh, but I'm health insured, so I can build my business on the other side. Oh, but, you know, I get holiday, I get money for holidays. Mm. I, I get my monthly salary. And so I don't think that I really knew what it meant to let go of that till I, I was told it's over. Yeah. And what happened to me was a flood of emotions, totally new emotions, because again, it felt as if I was being shipped away again. Mm. It always comes back, right? This whole, it, it, this recurring thing through my life of being sent off. Yes. Being always being sent off. You're born there, but then you grew up there, but then your parents moved to another place and then they moved back to Nigeria and then they moved you there. And I don't know sort of like this break in things. So I had to grow into, I had coached quite a number of people who had lost their jobs. Right. I could imagine what it felt like. Yes. But now, ooh, I had to experience it. I had to experience it. What does it mean? You know, we talk a lot about self-awareness. Oh, it's big. Who are you when you wake up? I remember the first the, the first week. So it happened on a, on a Monday, and I remember waking up the Tuesday, and I panicked, like, oh, my God, oh my, what happened? Why are you at home? Why? And then something said, calm down, breathe. You were asked not to come back. And the mixture of emotions, whoa, what does that mean? It's an identity have, loss, isn't it? Your identity is, oh, your, who are you? Yes. Who are you when you are not the role yes. you played so long? The person people ask questions, the person people ask for help, the person who mentors, the person who uh, at work, I was always, I, I don't know, I was like getting people to communicate. I had to laugh, you know. We don't only need to stare at our computers. Let's laugh. Let's smile. I'd go to my students. Who am I when I don't get my daily dose of the students I taught on Mondays or Tuesdays or Wednesdays or Thursdays or the people I interviewed? You know, I was doing recruiting. I was recruiting the teachers. I was training them. I was checking for quality management. I was um, assisting sales in recommending programs to students. Who are you when you can no more be that? Yes. And that is a whole process um. of healing and self-awareness. Yes. Self-awareness that is not based on labels, the roles, the titles, a totally new difference, Michael. A totally new experience. Sure. And it took a while. But what happened this time was, um, in 2012, I fell sick. And that was the first time that I was forced to ask for help. Because I, I, there were these injections. I couldn't walk for two months. Wow. And I had to give myself these uh, injections. And I am afraid. The, the needle was tiny. Yeah. But my dear neighbor, she said, oh, what happened? I said, I'm going to be operated. And they said I won't be able to walk while I heal. Um, she said, okay, don't worry. I'm sure you're going to have to take this uh, injection. I said, really? Uh, she said, yeah, I can give it to you. And so that was solved. Wow. And then I... I I remember going to the supermarket and filling my whole fridge up just to make sure that I don't need to ask anybody for help. Yes. I mean, I'm here 
living in Luxembourg, right? So I'm used to doing things on my own. Sure. Making sure that you don't show people you're weak. You don't show people you're suffering. You don't show people you're sad. You don't show people you're afraid. You don't show people you're depressed. What helped me? Uh, what helped me was not being able to walk and knowing that I had to ask my neighbor for help. Yeah. I asked her for help and she was like, oh, what do you need me to do? And I'm like, I have laundry. Can you? She said, no worries. Do you want me to change your sheets? I'm like, that would be kind. And letting someone help yeah. and just being okay with it, that in itself was so healing. It's, it humbled me deeply. And so when I got laid off, wow, I remember walking out of that office the whole process of laying me off took 12 minutes. That's it. Yes. And I remember walking out of the office. I was breathing. And I picked up my phone and I called my friend, who is a lawyer at one of the oldest uh, firms here. And I said, hey, I've been laid off. He said, did you sign anything? I said, no. Do you have the paper? I said, yes. He said, scan it to me, send it to me right now. Don't worry. Do you want me to come? I come and do. You, are you okay? How do you feel? I'm like I don't know. I think I'm shocked. Yes, but I'm okay. I'm 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 okay. I'm talking to you, and uh, I remember he said everything is okay, Omar. I've looked at the document. All is good. You'll be fine. I'm like okay, and I realized, whoa, who do you call next? So the opposite of what I would have done. Before 2012, where I would never have asked for help because of shame, because of like, oh, you can't let people know that this happened to you. Then I call, I texted my friend in Barcelona and I said, oh, guess what happened to me? I, I, I was let go. And she said, oh, hallelujah. I'm like, I don't think that is the appropriate reaction. <laughs> I said, that's not appropriate reaction. She said, I worked with you back then in 2011 when I was leaving, 2011 December. I left and we said we were going to leave. And look at how long it has taken you. So if, if seven years later, if, if they had not sent you out, you would still be holding on. Mm. And this is how my stepping up into courage, stepping up into courage, because now, I, of course, I could have immediately started sending out CVs, right? Yes. But I said, ooh, I'm going to breathe here. <laughs> you are already building a business. Continue. Intensify your processes. Do more of what you've not been doing. Step up into courage. Yes. Deal with the emotions. What do you feel right now? Make a difference between what you feel and what you are. There's a difference in saying, I, f I am frustrated or I feel frustrated. It's a big difference. Because when you make it part of you, you say, I am frustrated. You're personifying that. Whereas when you feel it, you know that feelings come and go. You understand? I totally understand. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, it was amazing. So I have been on the journey and I stepped up into courage. And all of a sudden, it is amazing. The doors that open when you step into courage, especially when things happen. When life happens. Mm. So I did not see, I did not even see the situation as a bad thing i saw it as an opportunity as an opportunity to rise into a space in which i can do more of what i do mm. and the doors just open i'm me i'm human i go with the flow of things i work a lot <laughs> i put in effort <laughs> you need to be, you need to be sure that you're doing the outer work but more important is the inner work. The only so, job we have 
is to work on ourselves. <laughs> oh, yes. And then at well, the same time, yes. earn a bit of money if you can. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I'm saying whatever you need to do, but if you've got a dream, it is so important that you really, uh, you know, unite with that dream and, and really ask yourself, is this something that you want to crystallize in your life? I knew that, okay, look, if I, I'm not, again, I am also not against nine to five, That I, I'd like to make that quite clear mm. because a lot of the clients I work with, they are in a nine to five, just like some are entrepreneurs. Okay. Yes. Whether you're in a nine to five, you've got emotions. Whether you're an entrepreneur, an executive, a leader, you, you everyone has emotions. Absolutely. And that's my work. Yeah. And I have a lot of people in nine to fives who actually love what they do and are, are doing good. So I'm not a friend of shaming people who are in a nine to five. Why? What is the point? It's a it's just, you know, when I was let go. Um, I realized that every every title or label only becomes part of you um, in, in depending on how you make it part of you. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. See, I realized that when I didn't have the job and I had overcome the shock, I realized I, I was still there. How surprising. <laughs> I didn't disappear. I was still me. I still meet some of my colleagues. Uh, there's a particular one. I meet her every Wednesday for coffee, for kind of a late brunch. We enjoy that. We have pancakes and we've got, we have coffee and we talk. And you know what she said to me? She said, yeah, you know, I realize it doesn't matter where you are. I need to see you once a week just to chat. Yes. So through that, and then I realized it's not where you work. It's not. Those are labels. Entrepreneur is a label. Nine to five, if you were an employee, being an employee, it's a label. Mother, it's a label. <laughs> Sister, it's a label. You're more than that, huh? You're more than that. Totally, Omo. Totally. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and your insights about all of this. And I know that the people that are listening to this will be inspired by your messages. But more importantly, you know, you've shown that if you have the right mindset and, you know, even when you are laid off from your job, then things can still work out if you've got the right mindset and you breathe through it and know that things are going to be okay. Um, yeah. Wonderful. So, Omo, we're, we're getting, I, we could talk for hours. I know we could, definitely. <laughs> and I will definitely need to take you up on the coffee and pancakes <laughs> one day. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> And, and and hopefully we will meet in person one day. Um, thank you so much for your time. Now, I'd thank like you. to ask you, where can people find more about you and how can they get in touch with you if they would like to? So um, I am very um, present on LinkedIn. I'm active on LinkedIn. So just typing in my name, Omozwa Ameze Siramen on LinkedIn. But if you would like to visit my uh, website, it is uh, omozua.com. My name.com. Omozwa. <laughs> Omozwa.com. And there uh, you can find uh, inspiration. I, I, I share uh, articles in there sort of every two weeks. And also to find, uh, to learn more about my Courageous Human uh, program, where um, if, you, you know, just to get more information, if you'd like to uh, work with me and step into your own courage, because everybody can do that with the right mindset. Absolutely. Fabulous. Excellent. Well, I will include those links also in the show notes and then people can find you and learn more about you and maybe even get coached by you. So um, let's hope that can happen. Thank you so much again, Omo, for your time and for your story. Really, really enjoyed hearing it. And 
um, fingers crossed, let's set the intention that one day we will meet in person as well. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.